Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 111, Assassin. Inside the dojo, Kazuya could be seen meditating in a lotus position, his Zanpakuto lying on his lap. His torso was bare, putting his muscular upper body on full display. Unfortunately, no one was here to witness his near-perfect stature. Jinzen swords and a Shinigami technique that allowed one to enter a tranquil state and journey into the inner world, connecting their minds with the Zanpakuto. He had been refining this technique, clawing desperately at the barrier separating him and his Zanpakuto spirit. Zero progress happened in three months. Nami's hibernation was even longer than her supposed time in the egg. Out of desperation, he had scoured the libraries for a possible solution a task that led him to seduce multiple instructors for deeper library access yet nothing worked. Yoruaki and Kisuke's solution was forcibly materializing his Zanpakuto's spirit. As if he'd interrupt Nami again during a potential evolution. All he could do was wait and try Jinzen meditation every day. Shaking off his concerns, he let out a sigh. Another day. Another failure. Wearing his kimono, he felt a sudden chill, an instinctive warning. His eyes darted, seeking a hidden danger, but the threat was already upon him. A sudden weight on his shoulder, the lethal embrace of Swa Fon's toned legs around his neck, and the cold touch of her Zanpakuto's stinger against his face. An assassin came for him for the first time, and he was caught off guard. Swa Fon, nice way to greet an old friend. He hadn't met her since the opening ceremony. Now she suddenly wanted to kill him. There was a big misunderstanding at play here, one that intrigued him more than threatened him. Kazuya, Swa Fon whispered in a cold voice. Suzumibaki's special ability is Nijeki Kesatsu. Anyone who gets hit twice in the same spot inevitably dies. Her words were deliberate to strike fear into his heart, yet he remained calm. Three months of gradual growth had increased his riot so to a point where he could unseal a Hagyaku on his own. Not to mention his regeneration ability served as a perfect counter to Swa Fon's Zanpakuto ability. Even without his regeneration, he could negate her ability with his Zanpakuto. Scary ability for such a cute woman, he said with a chuckle. Shouldn't you tell me the reason for this? You will answer my question. If you try to be smart, it's not hard for me to stab your neck twice. Well, what do you want to know? Did you? Swa Fon's voice trailed off, and she took a cold, steely breath as if bracing herself for an unwelcome truth. What do you know about your Yuaki sama Yoruaki Sama could you be talking about the exiled princess of Shihoing clan the legendary flash goddess who united the second division and on Mitsukido core. Like a hornet's sting, her blade dug into his neck, a swift and precise movement that drew a bead of blood, a butterfly-shaped mark bloomed at the wound, only to vanish as she pulled out the stinger. His wound healed instantly, his immense spiritual power and regeneration ability neutralizing her venomous Zanpakuto. Swa Fon's eyes, clouded by emotions, missed the disappearance of her beautiful crest. Do not try to lie. You have been using her Hakuta style in combat. We did meet a couple of times after her exile. Her body trembled momentarily at the revelation, which didn't he escape his senses. What is your relationship? Good friends is how I'd describe us. Sensing the truth in his words, Swa Fon's tense form relaxed. Captain Anohana had been bluffing. The Yuruaki she knew would never succumb to the charms of a man. For now, he continued, his voice tinged with mischief. Can't say what'll happen in the future. I have already confessed my love to her. You. Hold your hand, Captain Swa Fon. Rangiku arrived before him in a shunpo flash, followed by another woman with messy silver hair. She was a head taller than Rangiku, yet she didn't he possess half the confidence of Rangiku in her demeanor. The vice captain of the fourth squad was a lovable tomboy no matter how he looked at her. Rangiku's katana pointed at Swa Fon, her voice authoritative yet tempered. It's beneath your captain's status to show killing intent for a student. Why yeah, Captain Swa Fon, Isane stammered, her smile awkward but sincere. Let's talk things through. We'll find a solution. Kazwe gripped Swa Fon's thighs and tried to free himself but her grip was like a vice. He didn't he want to exert too much force and break her bones. Swa Fon, please don't bully me. Isane found herself stunned, 
captivated by his pleading voice. Nanea wasn't he lying, she was underselling how utterly persuasive his voice was. You aren't he innocent, Isane said with a frown. You're a woman predator. He cleared his throat. Lady Swa Fon, please let me go. I have to clear this misunderstanding. He was a bit depressed after Nami's disappearance and ended up sleeping around more than necessary. However, he only seduced the teachers, the senior students came to him on their own out of curiosity. He, of course, welcomed the desserts that kept knocking at his doorstep. Not that anyone involved with him took the relationship seriously it was just a transaction to find a solution to his Zenpakuto problem. No serious relationships. Suddenly, Swa Fon tightened her legs around his neck and growled at Rangiku and Isain. Stay out of my business, Vice Captains. She clung to him, desperation and determination in her eyes, still hoping to make him reveal your Yuaki's location. Rangiku's jaw dropped at Swa Fon's overbearing tone. You don't get to order us around. Stop this before we file an official report against you. Swa Fon gritted her teeth, her riotsu revolting around her. You leave now. Rangiku scoffed. Isane, get your Zanpakuto out. We might have to use force against her. Isane shook her head. Ugh, we're colleagues. Let us just sit down and talk. He clicked his tongue. Swa Fon, listen to Vice Captain Isane. Let us talk like adults. Instead of acquiescence, she grabbed his chin, her blade gauntlet grazing his neck with a dangerous promise. I will. His grip, steely and relentless, tightened on her ankles as he pried her hold with unsettling ease, her joints creaking ominously in protest. Seizing her butt with an audacity that defied his earlier delicate tone, he flung her meters away like a sack. Get off me, idiot. Swa Fon, ever graceful, stabilized her posture and landed like a fierce cat, her eyes blazing. Then she froze, stunned the absence of the butterfly crest on his neck unraveled her composure, leaving her in sheer astonishment. Even Yoruaki had not been immune to her Zanpakuto's effect. Caught in her shock, she couldn't register his shunpo movement as he appeared before her, his hand clutching her throat, lifting her with cruel ease. I was being nice, but you mistook my kindness for weakness, he spat, his voice as cold as ice, his fingers tightening menacingly. Swa Fon, let us test if a captain can suffocate to death. Swa Fon clutched his hand but there was no chance she could overpower him in this position. Mustering her core strength, she raised her legs and coiled them around his neck, trying to strangle him in reverse. He didn't even flinch at her desperate attempt to choke him. Laughable. Isane felt her spine shiver at the sight. A first-year student was overpowering Swa Fon who was known for her exceptional combat skills among the captains. She rushed at him, grabbing his arm. S stop. Don't hurt her. Rangiku also joined Isane from the other side. Just let go already. What is wrong with you two? She was starting to believe that Anohana's previous reputation wasn't he unwarranted she was a devil in setting up unanticipated conflicts. With an air of indifference, Kezia tossed Swa Fon on the floor. Swa Fon grasped her aching throat and coughed violently. Despite her vulnerable position, her eyes were filled with a dangerous fire. Her emotions reached unbelievable heights once Yoruaki was involved in any capacity. The fact that she could meet Yoruaki again filled her with unrelenting willpower. She was determined to fight him, despite her odds. Turning to Rangiku, he shrugged. She tried to kill me first. You witnessed that with your own eyes. Rangiku had nothing to say against him. She was there when Captain Anohana provoked Swa Fon into chasing Kazuya and she was present when Swa Fon pressed her Zanpakuto against his neck. Let us just forget this happened. Isane, heal Captain Swa Fon. Swa Fon slapped Isane's helping hand away. Just tell me where your Yuaki Sama is, Swa Fon roared, her hoarse voice cracking, and tears threatening to spill from her eyes. Where is she? As if summoned by her emotions, a black cat landed gracefully beside Kazuya, purring affectionately against his leg. Meow. He chuckled and cradled Yoruaki in his arms, stroking her chin. Yoruaki is in the Siridei. Do whatever you must with that information. Swa Fon stared at him with wide eyes. 
Then, with a flash, she vanished from the scene, hurrying over to the second squad's barracks. Kazuya's face softened at Swafon's desperation, a gentle smile replacing the earlier menacing look. Ladies, do you mind joining me for lunch? From pleading for his life to threatening a captain to extending a casual lunch invitation his mood swings were like a tempest, unpredictable and more dangerous than 99% of women. Chapter 112-113, Conditional Arrangement Spending time with well-versed teachers taught Kazuya a lot of things, one of which was about Ken, the currency used by residents of the Seoul Society. Shinigami salaries were paid in Ken, which resembled Japanese yen coins. The Siritei had a fully realized economy. The shops in the Siritei likewise accepted Ken as payment. Isane's eyes widened in astonishment as Kazuya confidently led them to a lavish restaurant, where the prices would make even a vice captain gulp. Yet he nonchalantly walked inside and took a seat. From overpowering a captain to casually dining at an expensive restaurant, none of his actions so far had resembled a student. Sitting comfortably, he waved at them. Come on, Vice Captains. The two vice captains entered the restaurant. Settling down on a chair in front of him, Rangiku gave Isane a comforting pat on the shoulder, winking at her with a reassuring smile. Order anything you want. The treat s on Kazuya. Isane's brows knitted in concern. How can I let a student pay I'll cover the bills? The vice captain was not one to splurge, living a modest life with the occasional expenditure on outings with her sister or contributions to the Shinigami Women's Association. Her salary was on the lower side for a vice captain but more than enough for her to save a fortune. Rangika raised a brow at Isane's generosity. What if we didn't he have enough for the bill what would he do then use your uncle as Hine's name like a good little boy? He chuckled softly at the playful jab regarding his bond with his hine. A hint of edge was present in Rangiku's tone. Perhaps rumors of his debauchery had reached her ears. It might become a how I took your mother out on her first date memory. Of course we need a decent place to show off to those little demons, he replied, his eyes twinkling with mischief. And don't worry about the bill. I can afford it. Some of the seniors he slept with hailed from noble families and they had given him quite a lot of money for giving them a good time, though most of them tried to flaunt their wealth to make him their boyfriend, only to fail. Coming from noble families, money was the last thing those noble princesses lacked. Isane's gaze went to Rangiku, who was beautiful, confident, and caring the ideal woman of most men. It almost sounds like a proposal. Rangiku laughed it off. Let the kid dream. By the way, did you borrow money from Captain Ishain? No I worked my ass off. Kazuya shifted his gaze to Isain, a decisive look appearing on his face. Vice Captain Isain, I have something important to discuss with you. Three months of arrogant declaration about Battle Healer had led to this moment a meeting with Anohana's closest person. He had to make the most of this opportunity and convince Isain to be a friend, which would give him an easier time in climbing the ranks of the 4th squad, from his canon knowledge, he remembered that Isane had a bit of a complex regarding her height. She even stopped sleeping at a point in her life to stop growing taller. There were also her weird nightmares, though they were pretty useless in their current conversation. It's just me and my voice. Isane's eyes widened, a pulse of surprise coursing through her, as she was addressed by her first name. It was a privilege often reserved for close friends, but never had a man used it with such nonchalance. Her thoughts raced, what is wrong with him? Gathering herself, she inhaled deeply and lightly patted her warm cheeks. So do I. What a coincidence. You first. You can. Rangiku stared at the two, who simultaneously gave each other the go-ahead call. What in the world was that? Isane's chuckle was tinged with nervous energy. Ishi Harakun, you can ask me anything. Anything reasonable, Rangiku corrected Isane narrowing her eyes at him. Don't ask her out on a date, though. She'll reject you. He let out a sigh. How did you read my mind? You were going to ask her out. Kazuya chuckled, warmth in his eyes as he looked at Isane. Maybe. Isane is friendly, beautiful, and strong. What s there not to like about her? Isane felt her cheeks grow hot. Rangiku, Ishihara san. Stay on topic. Getting this type of attention from a man made her nervous, 
and it showed on her face. He cleared his throat. I'm sorry if I creeped you out. Rangika gave him a teasing grin. You smooth talker. I can see how you charm 13 different women in such a short time. There was a reason, he said with a sigh. I had no choice. And what was that reason? He picked up the restaurant menu. Any dish you want to try. With a swift motion, Rangika took the menu, her smile gentle and inviting. We're all friends here. You can tell us. Right, Isane. Isane nodded. Yeah. We want to reveal your secrets. Like Rangiku, she was curious about the thing that compelled him to such extremes. She wanted to learn more about him so she could put Naneo off his back. He sighed. Let us order some food first. I'd like some dried persimmons, Rangiku whispered with a distant look. Every mention of the dish's name brought her mind back to some sweet moments spent with her childhood friend. Isane, don't tell me you're ordering porridge here. Isane averted her gaze. What s wrong with that I like porridge? Rangiku just shook her head. Isane was the only person who could porridge three times a day then eat it again at the restaurant. So, Rangiku said, urging him with a coy look. What is it? Isane leaned her chin on her palm and gazed out of the window, trying to appear uninterested but every fiber of her being was tuned to Kazuya's answer. Library access, he said slowly and raised his katana, which suddenly burst into dark red flames. He doused the flames with a thought and looked at the two with a sincere look, I can't connect to it no matter what I do. It's like she isn't even there. I was hoping something in the forbidden sections will help me. Rangiku leaned forward, interest sparkling in her eyes. How do you know your Zanpakuto spirit is female if you can't connect with your Zanpakuto? I heard her when I took my Asachi, he said, tapping the blade of his Zanpakuto. She said something about going to sleep. Haven T heard from her since. That s unheard of, Isane whispered. Did you? He simply shook his head, sliding his katana smoothly back into its sheath, a subtle hint of frustration in his movement. Forget about that. Might just be a snobbish spirit. Rangika giggled. I know the feeling. Mine refuses to manifest in this world, the little feline knows that I'll hoop her ass and get a bankai release. You hag, Hanko growled in her head. You're way too old to compete with me. A knowing smile touched his lips, remembering how Rangiku's Zanpakuto spirit had once manifested under Muramasa's influence like many others. To everyone's surprise, Rangiku's Zanpakuto spirit was a literal cat girl. Muramasa was pretty strong for a Zanpakuto spirit without a Shinigami. Is he canon in this world? His thoughts shifted as he looked at Isane, his eyes earnest. Isane, I'd like to be part of the fourth squad when I graduate. We know. Captain Anohana we would love to have you on board. Isane's voice was warm but trailed off, uncertainty flickering in her eyes. Is this really what you want? Why what s wrong with joining the fourth squad? I saw your fight with SWAT FON, you can be part of any other squad. The fourth squad was one of the most important divisions of the Go DI-13 but they were pretty much mocked by most Shinigami for being the weakest. I'm not going to be exclusive to the fourth squad. He directed a confident grin to Rangiku. I'll be part of the tenth squad as well. Like three days here, three days there, and one day off. Nice, yeah. He hadn't he given up hope of joining two squads. In fact, he was more confident that he'd succeed after his debacle with SWAT FON. Then just stick. Nope. I said I'd be the battle healer. I'm not abandoning my goal, he interrupted her with a confident voice. Besides, being a healer isn't all bad. It's a nice job for lazy people like me. Rangika reclined, crossing her arms, her eyes sharp. I'll let you join the 10th squad on one condition. I mean, your approval wouldn't he mean anything. Uncle Ishine wouldn't he say no to my request. Rangiku's eyes shook. Every one of his words were right. Ishine had made up his mind to train Kazuya to be his successor as the next captain. Her disapproval meant nothing. Offending the vice captain before you're part of the group. I'll make your life hell. Hey, that s so petty. Didn't he you say we were friends? I'll be your superior. Rangika raised her chin, 
mimicking the arrogant nobles to the best of her ability, at work, I'm the pettiest woman in the world. You can confirm it with your uncle Ishain. Dot What's your condition? Rangiku's expression was sultry, her eyes gleaming with mischief. I want you to use your voice to entertain people. He blinked, taken aback. Like singers. He never thought Rangiku of all people would ask him to become a singer in the Siritei. Something was wrong with this timeline. Yes. Rangiku nodded. You've got a lot of potential from what I can see. What's more, your popularity will skyrocket. You'll be the name upon every soul in the soul society. He wanted to roll his eyes at her outrageous suggestion. No thanks. Why don't you want to be famous don't you want every girl in the soul society to idolize you at LLB so fun? No. He had greater ambitions and no desire to be a mere idol. Rangiku's eyes widened, a flicker of shock and disbelief dancing within them at the unanticipated rejection. Her best temptations had crumbled against the impenetrable wall of his resolve. Come on, Kazuya. Give it a try. I told you I'm not interested. Just kill some singer from the living world and bring him here. His ice-cold tone left no room for questions or protestations. Rangiku had no choice but to abandon her playful pursuit of erecting an empire, despite her unwillingness. Looks, voice, confidence. He is the perfect candidate. Isane looked at her friend whose disappointment was immeasurable. Ishi Harakun, give it a try please. She pleaded on Rangiku's behalf but he simply shook his head. Even if he was attracted to both women, getting swept into the entertainment industry was far from his goal. It's fine, Isane. I can understand his point of view. He wants to be a Shinigami, not a singer for the masses. Isane placed a consoling hand on Rangiku's shoulder. Ishi Harakun, you have to convince Captain Anohana about your two squad plan. It'll L be hard. Captain Anohana was open to Kazuya joining their squad, but she wouldn't be keen on sharing him with the 10th squad. Hiring a part time Shinigami in their division would make them look even weaker. Kazuya leaned forward and took her hands in his own, his warmth taking her by surprise. I sane, can I rely on you? His voice was a caress, tempting and tender nearly coaxing a nod from her. But she resisted the urge, summoning every bit of willpower she had honed as a Shinigami. As a healer, she was used to physical contact with the opposite gender. Yet, the intimacy of the moment, the warmth of his touch, his handsome face, all combined to challenge her professionalism. A blush colored her cheeks as she met his gaze, a myriad of emotions in her eyes. Help Rangiku if you want me to cooperate. Isane clenched her teeth and threw out her own condition to help him. Please, just try it once. You might enjoy this more than you think. In her childhood, she never would be imagined living the life of a healer yet here she was. Saving people's lives and spending time with her mother figure was such a blessing for her. She wouldn't give up her current life for anything in the world. Fun. He pulled back his hands, his eyes softening into a warm smile. He was weak to sincere women and Isane was the embodiment of sincerity right now. And our dishes are here. There was no condition for him to commit to the job as a singer. He could dip out after one try while Isane had to convince Anohana. She was on the losing side no matter how he looked at it. Rangiku immediately poured herself some wine and raised her glass with a bright smile. To a new opportunity. Isane also raised her glass filled with water, clicking it against Rangiku's glass to a new opportunity. Rangiku's eyes sparkled with anticipation as they turned to Kazuya. He reached for the wine, filled a glass, and raised it, drawing a joyous cheers from the two women. To a new opportunity. Chapter 114, A Misunderstanding Kazuya returned to his dorm room and was met with an unexpected sight at his door. Momo Hinamori stood there, her eyes brightening with a radiant smile as she caught sight of him. Yet, the subtle shine at the corner of her eyes revealed a different story she was crying. Momo, who bullied you his voice was tinged with fury that made Momo shiver. Tell me that bastard's name and I'll fucking burn them down. Though she was surrounded by a circle of friends, he couldn't he completely dismiss the thought of some haughty noble targeting her. He would stir up the entire academy if anyone bullied her or Tashiro. Momo was taken aback by his fiercely overprotective response. I wasn't he crying. 
Why did you skip classes again? Her reprimands had become a familiar scene, a well-intentioned but exasperating ritual every time he missed classes. It was almost endearing, like a concerned friend persistently trying to mend his delinquent behavior. She had yet to realize that he was beyond saving at this point, that he hardly cared about the academy. He gripped her shoulders, eyes locking with hers, sincerity shining in his gaze. If I ever found out that you lied to me, I will. He paused, thinking about the mildly shameful punishment for her. I will spank you. Momo's cheeks flushed a bright crimson, like ripe tomatoes, and she hastily brushed his hands from her shoulders. No one is bullying me. His eyes, trained to discern even the subtlest deception, found no signs of falsehood in her body language. He nodded, satisfied. Swinging open the door with a graceful gesture, he invited her inside and unceremoniously plopped onto the bed, assuming a relaxed lying position. Her eyes darted around the room, finding the third of their group missing. Shiro must have gone to do his daily Jinzen training. In the span of three short months, Tashiro had reached a monumental milestone, he had come so close to unlocking the Shikai form of his Zenpakuto. He just needed that one moment of threat to crave more strength from his Zenpakuto and unlock his Shikai. Shiro is pretty hard working. Yeah. Momo nodded and perched herself on the bed opposite to Kazuya. Kazuya kun, do you really want to graduate this month? Her voice oozed with sadness as she contemplated his departure from the academy. She neither had Kazuya's talent nor did she possess anything special like Tashiro's Zanpakuto. It would take her three years minimum to graduate. Momo, don't make that face. You and Shiro know my deal. The academy has nothing to teach me now. Had any other student uttered such audacious words, Momo might have burst into laughter. But coming from Kazuya, the proclamation was true in every sense. He was more than qualified to be a Shinigami before he enrolled into the academy. She drew her knees to her chest and hugged them, her eyes pinning him down. Why do you have, blood on your neck? He touched the spot unconsciously, the memory of Swa Fons blade briefly flashing in his mind. Your Yuaki bit me there earlier. Liar. She whispered, the word barely escaping her lips. Your Yuaki-san told me everything. It looked like Yuriyuki had revealed his fight with Swa Fon during his outing with Rangiku and Isain. Why would she do that he had no idea? It just added another question to the stack he had reserved for Yuriyuki today, most of which were regarding her stance on Swa Fon's fanatical obsession. With a sudden intensity that contrasted her earlier distant demeanor, Momo approached his bed and straddled his waist. Her hands clutched his collar, her eyes on the verge of tearing up. I, I was so scared when I heard that. Provoking the captain of assassination squad, what were you even thinking? Her trembling voice was every bit of proof for her concern. In his first spar with Swa Fon, Momo had marveled at the dance of martial arts, a beautiful display of their fighting skills. Back then, she was naive. It was only after the lectures, with the cold clarity of knowledge, that she understood the deadly reality of Swa Fon and the second squad of the Go Di 13. These were no ordinary warriors, they were a ruthless hand of justice, dishing out torture, interrogation, and assassination within the Soul Society. Kazuya's silence only deepened her distress. She nestled her head against his chest, her tears seeping into his uniform like dark stains of worry. You can't be so reckless, what if she had killed you? He sighed and calmly patted her back. Your Yuaki fooled you, idiot. I sent Swa Fon away crying. She was no match for me. She raised her head in surprise. What your Yuaki san claimed you wouldn't he have survived if he hadn't he healed you in time. He raised his hands. You're free to undress me and search for any wounds. Momo's eyes flashed with a dangerous glint as she reached for the straps of his hakama, tugging them open with a purposeful hand. I it s only for examination. She flicked open his hakama and his undershirt, checking for any sign of wounds. When she didn't he find any, her eyes moved to his lower body. No. He flicked her for it, a teasing reprimand that brought her back to her senses. Her innocent crush had matured into something more perverted, shaped by her exposure to diverse personalities in the academy. Though she often seemed reserved, her underlying curiosity and boldness would occasionally surface. When will she give up? 
he had caught her watching him with different seniors multiple times, yet her adoration for him remained unwavering. Then again, this was the same woman who had idolized Aizen to the brink of obsession. She clung to belief over evidence, her convictions unshaken even by a sword through her chest. She was the perfect devotee for any cult. That mischievous cat, Momo muttered, rubbing her reddened forehead. Why would he lie to me? Never take your Yuaki S words at face value, that cat likes to cause chaos and revel in it. I knew your Yuaki San had a hidden evil side, Momo whispered. You never told me how you two became friends or why your Yuaki San is cursed to be in a cat form. She misinterpreted your Yuaki S cat form as a curse like those powerful characters getting cursed in fairy tales. Your Yuaki S wisdom only solidified the idea in Momo S mind. He noticed a spark of hope in her eyes. Rather than knowing about his friendship with your Yuaki, she wanted to learn more about him. I'll tell you after you get off me. A glance downward, and the reality of their intimate position dawned on her. She darted to the other bed with a panicked Shunpo. It was nice. She murmured, hastily clearing her throat. Kazuya-kun, let us talk about your Yuaki-san later. I have an urgent request for you. Don't ask to see me naked. Even I have my limits. Her cheeks reddened, as if the mere suggestion had set her imagination alight. Her fantasies seemed to resonate within her, causing a subtle disruption in her riot suit. Can you please stay until the starting week of next month she asked, her voice soft and pleading. Two more weeks. Uh-huh. She nodded, her eyes wide and earnest. Sensei informed us that our class will have our first training mission in the living world. We'll practice soul burial and engage in combat with artificial replica hollows. Kazuya's eyes narrowed, his thoughts taking a sharp turn. Is this the same event that Aizen plans to use to test his Mino spread? The puzzle pieces were beginning to align, but his lack of concrete canon knowledge left him feeling like he was walking in the dark. The absence of Nami gnawed at him more than ever. He placed a hand on his katana, sending thoughts to his violent freak Zen Pakuto spirit. There was no answer as he expected. Where exactly is the mission taking place? Momo tilted her head, her expression one of concentrated innocence. It's somewhere in Japan called. Karakura Town. That name struck him like a chord, resonating with his suspicions. Of all the places they could have chosen, they had somehow selected the very place where some of the most powerful hollows lived. Was this an intricate play to draw attention to Kisuke and the Visored or perhaps a devious trap to lure out the members of El Inverso Sure. I'll accompany you on the mission. Momo's face lit up. Gone were the traces of her previous gloom, all that remained was pure happiness. Thanks, Kazuya-kun. Humming cheerfully, she skipped out of the room, a spring in her step. What is she planning? Chapter 115, Restart Kazuya was lying on the bed after Momo left, waiting for your Yuaki's return. Two more weeks. Should I return to Haribel or give her a surprise at the mission? He ruled out the second option since he might be under surveillance as a Shinigami. Fighting Swa Fon, stirring troubles within the academy, and showing potential to be a powerhouse all these deeds had painted a bull's eye on him. Countless eyes would be scrutinizing his every action during the mission. Guess I'll take a week off and spend some time with them. While the taboo thrill of romantic affairs with teachers had its allure, none could replicate the soothing haven that Haribel's presence offered. He could do a reconnaissance mission to Hueco Mundo to see if Nelil had undergone any transformation during his absence. Thinking about his future, he unknowingly drifted into a slumber. He didn't he resist the urge as a nap was necessary to reset his mind after everything. He woke up to the rhythmic motion of a moving mount beneath him. Deja vu washed over him. He found himself engulfed in the perpetual dusk of Waco Mundo, accompanied by an eerily familiar riding experience. A knot of dread tightened in his chest. Shifting slightly, he caught sight of a passai in her deer-like form, a form he hadn't seen in what felt like ages. Hey, you. You're finally awake, she greeted, much like their prior encounter. But a glaring anomaly stared him in the face. Gone were his horns, wings, and even his once flowing locks were shorn, echoing a past life's hairstyle. He was stripped of all hollow attributes, as if time had wound back and morphed him into a regular soul. His Ryurioka levels had plummeted, sinking him to the mundane level of an average living soul. 
in a reflexive act, he pinched his cheeks and twisted his own ear until it flushed crimson. The resultant sting squashed any notion that this could be a figment of a twisted nightmare. Even his call-outs to the mysterious system yielded utter silence. I got a hard reset as a powerless man. Powerlessness. The term clung to him like an ill-fitting garment. He was weaker than the lowest class of hollows. And the worst part he had no regrets about his life or longing for a redo. His life was perfect as it was. Now, every bond he had built was snatched away from him. Lovers and friends he couldn't he live without. Could he regain those relationships without the crutch of his system and his vast O Lord prowess doubt clouded his usually resolute spirit, marking the first instance of vulnerability. He was on the verge of a mental breakdown. Is this the scheme of the god who reincarnated me what a sick bastard? Grimacing, he felt a surge of rage welling up within him, directed at the unseen architect of his shattered existence. The things he would do to the orchestrator would be unsuitable for even the most depraved minds. You're one rude fellow, a passi said. What else did I expect from a male? A passi's grumbles brought him out of ever-consuming hatred. He extended his hand to caress the fur bordering her sensitive ears. Her eyes shut momentarily as a soft purr resonated from her throat. The action was undeniably a passi, she d always had a soft spot for his tender touch. A passi. She snapped out of her contented state, her hooves skidding to a halt. How do you know my name? Hopping gracefully from her back, he stood before her, locking eyes. Believe it or not it's not our first meeting. You and I go way back. She blinked her eyes in confusion. Dot how I never saw you before today. I'm pretty sure of it. Well, I don't know why you forgot about me, he said with a shake of his head. Tell me, Apassi. Why did you save me? The old Apassi showed compassion for his hollow holes. She had no reason to rescue an average soul. It'd be far easier to just consume him and be done with him. Only he could discern the inconsistency because of spending too much time with her. Why save you you looked fragile, defenseless. I'm regretting my her words were abruptly severed by a bone-chilling roar. Her body quivered, and her eyes darted backward. Fuck, it's back. We're dead. So dead. He immediately climbed atop her and patted her back. Is it the Ajitches who look like a combination of snake and caterpillar? You know that too never mind. Questions can wait after we survive him. With a powerful lunge, she shot forward, the wind from her sprint nearly knocking him away from her. He bent down and hugged her before she incorporated Sonito into her movement and destroyed his body from sheer wind pressure. It s right behind us. Even without his finely tuned senses, the emanating menace of the pursuing Ajiches made his heart race and his skin slick with nervous sweating. The irony was cruel, once he could have shattered a vasto lord with his Ryatsu alone. Now, standing close to an Ajiches Ryatsu would destroy him. There is only one fate awaiting you, little dear. Cease your resistance and become a part of a greater Ajiches like me. A Passai, it's closing in on us. He loathed the feeling of depending on someone else for survival. Yet, it was his only choice if he wanted to discover the truth. I'm doing the best I bloody can. A Passai's voice tore through the air as her hooves pounded with renewed fervor. Damn that fiend. That absolute fucker. Furiously, a Passai cursed the menacing hollow trailing them, its razor-sharp claws aching to snare them. For the Ajiches, devouring a Passai was essential for maintaining its existence as an Ajiches, for a Passai, escape was a desperate bid for survival. It was a deadly race with only one possible victor. Fate, however, seemed to have rolled the dice against a Passai. Small and less endowed with energy compared to her hulking pursuer, her stamina was quickly draining. Despite Kazuya's earnest words of encouragement, her hooves eventually faltered, and she collapsed on the ashen soil of Waco Mundo. He caressed a Passai, his eyes darting around for the shark-themed Vasto Lord. She was nowhere in the vicinity as far as he could see. It's not a reset. It's a different timeline or, a fabricated reality. A Passai sluggishly opened her eyes and nudged him with her horn. This is, it for me. He won to chase you after eating me. Run away. Her words echoed the sacrificial motto that characterized the Trace Bestia. Yet, Kazuya found her response most peculiar. Before meeting him and falling head over heels for him, 
she was the kind to go down fighting rather than laying down and giving up. She had even been prepared to challenge him a vasto lord when she thought he'd eat her. Would that type of woman sacrifice herself for a man she knew for an hour? Absolutely not. The Ajitches was closing in at an alarming rate, and time for deliberation had run out. Faced with the grim decision of abandoning a Passai or confronting their mutual doom, he threw away the thought of self-preservation for the first time. If my assumptions are wrong, I'm dead for real. Planting himself firmly in front of a Passai, he greeted the Ajitches with a disarming smile, every ounce of his being radiating defiance. You aren't eating my wife today. I swear on my life, I'll protect her. Chapter 116, Shinko no Tsubasa. The hulking Ajiches unleashed a scornful laugh that echoed around them. Locking eyes with Kazuya, who had bravely positioned himself in front of a Passai, the creature jeered, What utter garbage you are to face me. Die. The Ajiches' arm swung through the air with such force that Kazuya could hear the very wind shrieking in its wake. Yet, he stood his ground steadfast and unyielding. It s not real. He repeated within his head, almost as though his mantra could ward off the impending doom. Yet, when the arm should have struck him, a breathtaking explosion of vivid flames burst forth instead. Whirling around, he realized a Passai had vanished swallowed by the inferno. A surge of energy coursed through him, his dormant powers were reawakening, filling his fists with the tingling sensation of oppression. I knew it he said, tilting his head upwards to address the heavens. Nami, I swear to God if you don't cut this crap right now. He fully expected Nami to be behind this twisted prank. Nobody would be surprised if this was her way of saying welcome back. Nami should not be blamed for my actions, echoed a dreamlike voice. From the swirling vortex of orange and vermilion flames emerged a towering figure. She was swathed in a lavish, impossibly long gown that looked as though it had been woven from molten lava, its ivory accents stark against the deep red. Five burning pairs of blade-like wings sprouted from her lower back, and an ostentatious winged mask obscured her face, leaving only her smirking lips visible. His gaze fastened onto the two energy sword-like blades that hovered beside her, each encasing a crimson crystal that mirrored the gem at the hilt of his own Zanpakuto. He would have mistaken her for Nami if not for those blades. Spoiler. You must be my new Zanpakuto spirit. Correct. I'm Shinko no Tsubasa. You may call me Tsubasa. Her high and mighty tone made him clench his fists. Tsubasa, why did you do that? What you experienced was merely a trial orchestrated by me, she said slowly as she gazed at him with a gentle smile. To test your determination to protect your loved ones. I cannot let an unworthy master wield my powers. He blinked his eyes in surprise. How was that a fucking test? His typically relaxed demeanor had shattered, replaced by a seething rage catalyzed by her manipulative trial. Slightly shaking her head, Tsubasa replied, To see your true conviction, I had to observe you at your lowest. People only care about themselves in their most desperate times. I'm glad you forego the thought of self-preservation to protect your beloved. You'll be a splendid master. With eyes clenched shut, he inhaled deeply, as if trying to draw calmness from the very air. But tranquility eluded him. His intrusive thoughts broke through the barriers of his rationality like a tempest. In his mind, there was no reasoning that could excuse her for plunging him into an abyss of helplessness. He would drown her in her own blood until she regretted her sadistic machinations. Morphing into his soul form, he summoned his Zenpakuto. A dark, purple aura enveloped him the tangible manifestation of his insatiable urge to kill. He surged towards her. As he lunged, one of the ornate daggers beside Tsubasa dematerialized. In its place, a blazing, hollowed-out shield erupted into existence. His katana collided with her incandescent barrier repeatedly, sending sparks cascading like falling stars. Yet, her shield remained unscathed, a stubborn defense against his relentless strikes. Spoiler! This shield was a projection of his own Chikai. It was an ironic realization that Tsubasa, a Zanpakuto born from his overprotective nature, used the very same protection against him. A disconcerting giggle escaped Tsubasa's lips. This unyielding shield will soon be yours to command, master. Couldn't care less. In a flicker, he utilized Shunpo to materialize behind her, his blade descending toward her unprotected back. Yet, 
With a pyroclastic burst, the shield rematerialized to thwart his deadly assault. Let me cut you down just once. You'll likely regenerate from those phoenix flames of yours. Master, has Nami rubbed her violent tendencies on you? Tsubase amused. I was right in suspecting her as a bad influence on you. The mention of Nami brought his attacks to a halt, his rage subdued by the worries for his other Zen Pakuto spirit. Where is she? With a flourish of her hand, Tsubasa manipulated her flames, weaving them into a fiery wall. It depicted Nami, in bird form, trying to bite the net of a birdcage. She's currently detained without any access to her flames. His eyes widened in disbelief. Stop being a cliched villain. Release Nami and maybe, just maybe, I'll consider forgiving you. I cannot comply. Without her distractions, you can focus on what truly matters protecting those you love. My Shikai ability, Fumetsu no Siaki Indestructible Sanctuary, can shield you from anyone. You do not need her in your life. Tsubasa's perspective on Nami was simple the Black Phoenix was a distraction as observed in her constant reminders about his lover's mortality. She was very much against Nami's stance. Who the hell do you think you are for dictating my life? I am a shadow born from your soul, your Zanpakuto spirit. Your resolve shapes my very essence, she said, a smile pulling at her lips as she raised a finger. However, I'll consider releasing Nami if you can make me submit and reveal the chant needed to unlock your Shikai. Exhaling a weary sigh, he muttered, make you submit I have to beat you. To attain Shikai, a Shinigami must gain the approval of their Zanpakuto spirit and learn of its name as well as the release incantation a well-known fact among the Shinigami. She nodded, her gaze unyielding. Correct. Can you overcome the impenetrable wall that is my shield? Before she could complete her sentence, he metamorphosed into his hollow form and grabbed a hold of her shield. Fiery eruptions burst from the shield, a desperate, blazing attempt to dislodge him. But he clung tenaciously, his palms pulsing with the power of oppression. The torrent of flames almost withered under his oppression. Just as he was about to break apart the structure of her shield, her fingers wrapped around its edge, and she swung it brutally into his chest. I can't allow you to do that. Afraid much so much for being impenetrable. She shook her head, her eyes ablaze with conviction. A shield is only as robust as the mind that wields it. A shield master would be egregiously foolish to stand idly by, allowing their enemy to dismantle the first line of defense especially when that defense stands between their enemies and those they be vowed to protect. Geez, you never shut up about this golden rule of protection, do you? Tsubasa let loose a smile but he could feel the anxious strains of her smile. My would-be master, we both follow that creed. I'm simply more vocal about our vision. Yeah, sure. Chapter 117, At Mercy Though Kazuya wished to humble the haughty Zanpakuto spirit, he knew better than to squander his energies in futile attacks against her shield. He paused, eyes narrowing to study the almost celestial flame surrounding Tsubasa and her guardian shield. These luminous, incandescent fires stood in stark contrast to Nami's sinister carmine flames. It was as if Tsubasa was crafted to be Nami's polar opposite the radiant light to Nami's darkness her antithesis. She might have inherited the life property of Phoenix's flames. One conclusion was irrefutable from their first clash her flames did not wound him, not even superficially. And why would they they all originated from his soul? Gently resting her palm against her ornate mask, Tsubasa tilted her head with a maniacal stiffness. While I have no objection to standing here as you marvel at my flawless grace, the clock is unforgiving, master. Each moment you waste in this inner world will take a toll upon your consciousness. Say, am I allowed to beat you by any means necessary? The last thing he wanted was for her to invalidate his hard-earned victory through an underhanded tactic, she might do that just to piss him off further. Your sole objective is to liberate Nami from my grasp. The means are inconsequential as long as your goal is achieved. She paused, her lips curling into a sly smirk. Any attempt to use your oppression ability from a distance would be in vain as we possess the same level of Ryatsu in this realm. It's almost a pity, really. You have the determination, the unyielding will for protection. What you lack is the capacity to bypass my invincible defense. Her taunts, whether premeditated provocations or genuine overconfidence, only stoked the fires of his resolve to put her into her place. 
Confronted with his seething silence, Tsubasa lavishly licked her lips. Conceding. Defying her calculated predictions, Kazue morphed into his soul form, conjuring his Zenpakuto into existence with a wave of his hand. The katana materialized effortlessly, a stark realization washing over him, Tsubasa had methodically manipulated his inner world, transforming it into her personal battleground. It now made sense why she had spent three whole months summoning him into this trial, she was not just growing, but plotting for this precise moment. Even so, he had no desire to lose against a three-months-old soul, much less the manifestation of his own desires. You do know that Blade has no special power, she said, pointing at the katana in his hand. It's a blade that can never cut through my shield. A blade is as strong as the one wielding it. Abruptly, he vanished, reappearing before her in a dazzling streak of Hirankyaku. Her shield sprang forth to fill the air between them. He lunged, his katana seeking the minuscule gaps in her seemingly invincible shield, only to be repelled by an unseen force. The physical shield, it seemed, was but an illusion the real protection was a barrier that protected its owner. Not one to be easily deterred, he kept the onslaught relentless, darting and slashing in fluid strokes, searching for a weak spot in her defense. It's of no use, master. You must find a new strategy. Isnt that one of your specialties. She was at full leisure to talk despite being attacked from all sides. Even he would be hard pressed to react to such attacks without feeling overwhelmed, which confirmed his theory regarding the automated defensibility of her shield. The shield acted on its own to protect its master from any danger or she had far superior reflexes than him. A spark ignited in his eyes. I need a pincer attack. He transformed into his hollow form and drew a cut across both of his palms, the blood serving as a catalyst to the superior version of Ciro Gran Rey Ciro. Flexing his fingers into talon-like formations, he conjured two azure orbs, each crackling and swirling with raw energy. The orbs expanded enormously until it dwarfed a standard Ciro by magnitudes. It was the strongest Gran Rey Ciro to ever exist. Tsubasa curiously observed his actions. It was evident that she still didn't take him seriously. Her underestimation worked in his favor. He unleashed a Gran Rey Ciro from his right hand. Concurrently, his heel struck the earth, propelling him beyond the sound barrier to materialize behind her. Since her shield was guarding her from the first Gran Rey Ciro, her back was completely exposed. Unfurling his left hand, he launched the second Gran Rey Ciro. Suddenly, Flames burst forth from the second blade hovering near Tsubasa, materializing into yet another shield. The two barriers expanded, amalgamating into a translucent red sphere around her her ultimate defense, Fumetsu no Siaki indestructible sanctuary. In this form nothing could reach her. Valiant, but fruitless, she said, a smirk curling her lips. I cannot be harmed what's happening. Her realization came a second too late. He was already gripping both shields, his hands glowing with the familiar glow of his unique ability. Her shell-like barrier presented an opportunity before him and he had seized it. His lips contorted into a sneer as his riot so crept like tendrils through her once unbreakable shields, manipulating its essence from within. He lightly flicked each shield, disintegrating them into a cloud of bronze dust that dispersed, eventually becoming one with the ashen expanse of Waco Mundo. Her uniquely crafted blades tumbled gracelessly to the ground. His oppression didn't he distinguish between the real world or his inner world it destroyed her shields with ease. You tricked me. Cutting off her stunned retort, he lunged forward, seizing her head in a vice-like grip before smashing her into the ground with shattering force. Kneeling atop her chest to secure her, he squeezed her throat and ripped away her mask. Her oceanic eyes shimmered with unshed tears, her ethereal beauty capable of evoking a sense of sympathy in any man. But he wasn't he fooled by her crocodile tears. He raised his hand and swung in a ruthless arc until it made a shuddering impact with her pale cheek. The merciless slap instantly painted a side of her face in a vivid scarlet. A shiver ran through her body, her eyes closing involuntarily, lips bitten as though to trap unspoken words. This humiliation, is nothing, master. I shall never regret my decision to put you through a trial. If I'm to lend my strength to someone, I want them to be worthy of it. Quietly, he delivered a reverse slap on her right cheek then another on her left cheek. Master. Slap. Listen to me. Mast. 
slap, slap, slap. His hands moved with grace as he delivered sickening slaps across her red face. Her muffled cries and whimpers served as a pleasing music to his vengeance. He satiated every bit of rage in his chest by beating his helpless Zanpakuto spirit and he loved every moment of it. He only stopped when her face had swollen to the point of being unrecognizable. Her entire face was smeared with tears, no haughtiness to be found within her eyes. The slaps had humbled her demeanor, at least for now. With a satisfied smile, he got back up and pulled her to her feet. Bring Nami to me. Her trembling lips managed a stutter, why yes, master, after I heal. As she reached out, her blades bolted into her grip. Instead of morphing into shields, they transmuted into twin red muskets, their barrels ornamented with intricate bronze phoenix motifs. Aiming the muzzles toward her chin, she squeezed the triggers, and a roaring inferno enveloped her. When the flames dissipated, her face was back to being flawless she was completely healed. Your cruelty is commendable, she whispered as she gazed at him in awe. A brute such as you would give his all in protecting your loved ones. Did you not hear me I said, bring me to Nami. As you wish. With a synchronized clap, she ignited the desolation of her imaginary Hueco Mundo. He found himself in a dilapidated throne room. Atop the fragmented majesty of a once regal throne rested the birdcage that held his self-proclaimed soulmate hostage. Chapter 118, End of Line Partner. You've come for me. Nami's fervent shout pierced through his emotional armor for a brief moment. He choked down the rising sentiment and directed his icy gaze toward Tsubasa. Hand me your blades and open the cage. A shadow of bewilderment flickered across Tsubasa's face before she complied with an obedient nod. With an almost ceremonial gesture, she made the blades drift to his side. Nami's cage clicked open, releasing her from her confinement. Like a phoenix rising, Nami burst forth until she hit the ceiling, her wings erupting into streaks of dark red fire. She rocketed toward Tsubasa with a divine fury, slamming her into the wall with an impact that echoed through the chamber. Stripped of her shields, Tsubasa was nothing but vulnerable to Nami's assault. As Nami landed on the ground, she underwent a surreal transformation morphing into a humanoid figure built from the essence of her own dark, sanguine flames. Her lanky limbs and featureless face floated above a conflagration sea of fire that served as her lower body. Though her face lacked defining emotion, he could feel the raging inferno within her Nami did not take her imprisonment lightly. She yanked Tsubasa from the ground and slammed her into the wall. I'll make you pay for keeping me away from partner. Not pausing for Tsubasa to even muster a response, Nami unleashed a flurry of merciless blows upon her face. Tsubasa reached out to him with a trembling hand, or rather the blades in his hands that acted as her shields. As though hearing her plea, the blades in his grip twitched, yearning to rush to their master's defense. But he held them fast. Nope, he said with an indifferent look. Nami, go wild. Tsubasa's Shikai ability provided excellent defense, even if it was a bit one-dimensional in nature. However, he very much loved Nami and supported her. Trapped in the same place for three months he couldn't even comprehend the resentment and rage bubbling inside her heart. She needed to unleash those negative emotions. He also couldn't deny that he enjoyed Tsubasa's one-sided epic beatdown at Nami's hands. It was satisfying to watch Tsubasa being pummeled like a punching bag. Nami threw Tsubasa to the ground and jumped at her, throwing punches at her bloodied face. Seemingly bored of beating Tsubasa, Nami pulled Tsubasa up by her blonde hair. You ambushed me when I was at my weakest and caged me like I was a beast. You lied and manipulated my partner into believing that I was not a suitable soulmate for him. You pathetic woman will pay for your sins. Her hands clenched into flaming talons around Tsubasa's head. With your life. You can't. Tsubasa's whisper was a dying ember as she shot a feeble glance toward him. I am your Zanpakuto spirit. Without me, you're defenseless. Shut your fucking mouth, Nami roared, her flames unleashing with even more ferocity. This is the end of line for you, ho. Huh? She burst into a fog of flames and engulfed Tsubasa's figure. Tsubasa desperately channeled her own flames to ward off Nami but Nami's carmine flames easily overpowered her. She stood no chance in a frontal fight against the senior Zanpakuto spirit, despite Nami lacking in terms of Ryatsu. 
Across the room, the blades exerted even more force than they went limp, quenched of life. Tsubasa was completely swallowed by carmine flames and her presence faded away. The flames then coalesced and twisted into a breathtaking form he'd never anticipated from Nami a mature woman with blonde wavy hair and an azure eye, punctuated by a heart-shaped pink glint. A dark eye patch draped across half her visage, culminating in a winged ornament that adorned her head like a crown. Though bearing some resemblance to Tsubasa, she was a mesmerizing mix of elven ears, demonic horns, and fiery, leathery bat wings sprouting from her lower back. Her fashion sense was also worlds apart from Tsubasa. She wore a scandalously revealing white dress, offset by an imperial crimson cape. She was a bewitching succubus. Spoiler. Hand on her waist, she struck a sultry pose. Behold the demon empress, who shall conquer this world with her beloved partner. A Chuyuni succubus role playing as a demon empress. Eye patch, check. Edgy dialogues, check. Cool fashion sense, check. Congrats. You're finally a full-blown Chuyuni. Yufufu, you're right. This is my first form. I can shape-shift into anyone with a snap of my finger. Want to see the versatility of a fire-based life form? Rather than playing along with shenanigans, he shifted the topic. Is Tsubasa dead? She nodded her head with a radiant smile. Completely erased from this world, devoured by me. Why are you worried, though do you miss her presence? What s there to miss about her he retorted on an impulse before taking a pensive breath. The blades in his hand had become inert and lifeless, revealing Tsubasa's end, alongside her broken Chikai ability. Fuck, all my hard work went to shit. Nami's repetitive praise for his Shikai and Bankai had set his expectations high. He had spent almost six hours every day for the past three months. Yet, his reward was a treacherous, arrogant Zanpakuto spirit, who almost broke him with her trial. Calling him disappointed was a massive understatement. He let out a sigh. Not gonna lie. Today was wild. The dormant blade suddenly sprang to life, breaking free from his grasp to whirl around Nami, the same way they drifted around Tsubasa. Nami, you. Yes, partner. I've assimilated that whore's essence, her potential, and her existence as a Zanpakuto spirit, she declared her bat-like wings flaring as she closed the distance with Shunpo and tackled him onto the ground. Looming over him, she revealed a grin that perfectly encapsulated every bit of her deranged infatuation. I'm your soul's and Pakuto spirit now. Nobody will come between us. Ever, rather than being creeped out by absurd craziness, he simply smiled and pulled her into his arms, her massive breasts squishing against him. Are you trying to give Haribal a run for her money? Exactly. I can't lose against partner's most beloved wife, she murmured as she audibly sniffed his scent. Partner, I missed you so much. It was so boring here without you. My imprisonment wasn't he even the worst part about this whole ordeal. What else could be worse than that? Tsubasa was born from both of our essence she reflected our souls. Think about it for a moment. She was manipulative like you and she was obsessed with an aspect like me. She was our daughter and I murdered her with my own hands. His mouth hung open, speechless. Her poetic reframing of Tsubasa's existence unsettled him deeply. Their actions seemed extremely immature once he took a moment to contemplate. They could be solved the situation more peacefully but their raw emotions overrode their reason. The result was Tsubasa's demise. Forget her, he replied, nonchalantly brushing off her concerns. Forget that she ever existed. Fine with me. Partner, do you remember your promise? Which promise? She leaned in and her fangs pierced the flesh of his neck. It was an intimate, lethal kiss that drew out blood, as if she were a vampire. The promise about eating me out when I became a vasto lord. You didn't tea ax you. Suddenly, an overwhelming surge of riot so filled the air like a torrential downpour, coming from the very woman wrapped in his embrace. Devouring Tsubasa triggered her evolution, bringing her riot su on par with Haribal S base Arankar form. I am a Vasto Lord or its equivalent. Gently withdrawing from him, she caressed his face, the heart shaped twinkle in her eye glowing brighter than ever, as if implying her burning passion. Don't you think it's time for us to do the deed? Seeing her beautiful face up close and feeling her warmth, 
his heart began to beat loudly, as if anticipating a passionate time with her. Just as he prepared to surrender to the moment, reality or whatever passed for it in this realm shuddered violently as if engulfed in a high-scale earthquake. The inner world is destabilizing. You spent too much time here, partner, Nami said with a sigh and pressed a reluctant kiss against his cheek. We'll have to wait. Um talk to me when I'm outside. You bet I will. Chapter 119 to 120, The Aftermath When Shunsui Kiraka first received the summons to the Shin-O Academy, he was skeptical. What could the Academy possibly conjure that required the presence of a captain but the moment he tilted the brim of his straw hat to survey the scene, his skepticism was blown into dust. Arrayed before him, members of the elite Kido Corps had woven their riotsu into a force field that enveloped what was once a student dormitory now a ruinous husk of its former self. Peering through narrowed eyes, Shunsui discerned the cause of the mayhem a silver-haired student tightly gripping his zanpakuto, encased within the shimmering force field. The boy was unleashing a storm of raw, uncontrollable riots so that couldn't he be contained by the Kido barrier. What was his name again? Naneo adjusted her glasses, a calculated move that concealed her own disbelief. Kazuya Ishihara. First year student. He has been releasing extremely strong riots for almost two hours with no signs of slowing down. Naneo had been on site since the calamity unfolded, having been invited by the headmaster for a guest lecture a perfect reason for observing the resident playboy. Fortunately, casualty counts stopped at a couple injured since the student body had been largely absent, attending the lecturers. She didn't even consider the massive property damage as it was a normal occurrence in her line of work. This boy could be another Zaraki in the making, Shunsui said with a chuckle. I believe he is having a hard time in his inner world. Perhaps his Zanpakuto spirit didn't he agree to reveal their name without a battle. That being said, Naneo-chan, you handled the situation nicely. I'm proud of you. Naneo almost rolled her eyes. She had sent him a message through the Hell Butterfly as soon as she could but he only showed up now. The officers of Kido Corps, on the other hand, showed up at a moment's notice, they were hardly in a position to deny a vice captain's order. What do I do next, Captain Kiraku will he ever stop? Shunsui patted her shoulder. He will eventually run out. Have the relief team secure him when that happens. They are better equipped to examine his condition. In the meantime, I'll persuade the headmaster to hold off on disciplinary measures against him. Naneo didn't he argue against him. Going by Kazuya's posture, it seemed like he had no idea about his Zanpakuto spirit's intentions. It wouldn't he be right to pin the blame on him. Understood, Captain Kiraku. While waiting for Kazuya's Ryurioku to drain, Naneo glanced behind her. She caught sight of a silver-haired boy peeking over the wall. He wasn't he that tall and she could imagine him standing on his friend's shoulders for the extra height. Their antics unwittingly coaxed a smile from her. These kids are so stubborn. She had read about them in her intel Momo Hinamori and Tashiro Hitsugaya two talented rookies with great potential. The two had stubbornly tried to disrupt the Kido Corps officers in their work until she pulled them aside and patiently explained about Kazuya's condition. Even now they harbored doubts and kept an eye on her from a distance. When is it going to end? Kazuya's eyes fluttered open, each blink like a drumbeat reverberating through his skull. It was the most severe headache of his life, worsened by the gnawing emptiness in his gut that sapped his remaining shards of mental fortitude. Kazuya Kun. Momo's voice broke through his disorientation the instant he stirred on the bed. Her hand enveloped his own, tears glistening in her black eyes. You're back with us. Take it down a notch, Momo, Tashiro scolded Momo for being overexcited yet he couldn't he suppress his own rising emotions. He swiveled his head towards the door, as if the gesture would hide his vulnerable expression. I'm going to update Vice Captain Kitetsu. Fetch me something to eat while you're at it, Kazuya said, getting a nod from Tashiro as he ran out of the room. It's the fourth squad. Why yes, Momo stuttered, using her sleeves as makeshift tissues. Eek. We're at the healer squad. Let s fucking go and seduce Anohana right now. She ll fucking gut me. I'm so tired. You did spend an excruciating amount of time in your inner world. Pushing himself into a sitting position, he shifted his attention back to Momo. Mind giving me a recap of everything. 
Rather than humoring his request, Momo turned her head away with a pout. You scared me twice in a day. Why are you like this, Kazuya-kun? At least she was assured about his safety the first time around. This time, she had gnawing doubts that he'd burn himself out alongside his riot suit. He cleared his throat. Well, my Zanpakuto spirit was acting like a pain in the ass. Had to chastise her for her actions. Chastise Momo stopped pouting and burst into a fit of laughter. Who even uses that word anymore? Did you just call me old let me remind you that I'm 21 years old. And you're a hundred. You're lying. Momo stared at him with a blank gaze. How is it possible for you to be so strong? He shrugged. Proper diet and training with your Yuaki. Tell me, partner. When did you get so close with this chick? Stuff happened. Such an elaborate explanation. I moved to tears, partner. It cured my depression. I was sick, Depeer. Dante used that shit on me, bitch. Head. After a few more minutes, Tashiro returned, alongside another woman dressed in a pink nurse outfit the standard dress issued to the 4th Squad S members stationed at the relief center. The high-level Shinigami of the 4th S Squad weren't mandated to wear the nurse outfit. Truly a disappointing decision. The meals served to him were a bigger letdown in comparison. Nevertheless, Kazuya tore into the meal like a ravenous beast, unhesitatingly asking for and annihilating seconds. As he wolfed down the food, Momo recounted the events, his own riot so induced demolition and collateral damage. The presence of Naneo at the scene might have something to do with the absence of shackles on his hands. Call is Hein if anything happens. I will. And for hell's sake, tell me everything that happened in the past three months. I wanna know about everything. A lot actually. Let us talk later. With a swift motion, Kazuya picked up the katana perched at his bedside, turning it over in his hands. The blade had adopted a more aggressive curve, as if evolving to mirror his adaptability. The katana had another gem added to its hilt, bringing the number to two. The gems held significance. Is the last one saved for Bankai? Yup. Tsubasa deceived you on many fronts, even the Shikai's abilities. The muskets are loaded with restoration bullets, which can heal anyone from the brink of death. Tsubasa's flames are all about healing while mine can do destruction and limited creation. Basically, I'm unkillable with my Shikai. As long as you don't run out of juice, yes. Can I access your flames? Technically, I can lend them to you through our Zanpakuto bond. It will destroy your Zanpakuto. Use them with your Shikai. Got it? One more question, can you still be my resurrection? Nami's existence as both his Zanpakuto and his resurrection still baffled him. In theory, he could access both resurrection and Shikai at the same time, which seemed overpowered just from the riot suit boost of both skills. However, things might not be as simple. I think. I'm tied to you still, as your resurrection. I'm also your Shinigami S. Zanpakuto. The Demon Empress will do it all for her partner. We LL test it in the living world. Before he could muse further, the door swung open, and Vice Captain Isane strode in, her face illuminated by a polite smile. Both Tashiro and Momo looked up, their expressions freezing into blank stares that bore into Isane, enough to make her squirm. Tashiro showed no happiness at the arrival of another busted woman, while Momo's eyes fired icy daggers at the woman who came to visit Kazuya. Ah, Vice Captain Isane. A pleasure to see you here, Kazuya greeted, before playfully slapping Tashiro and Momo on their backs and gesturing toward the door. I'll catch up with you later. Call me if you need anything, Kazuya-sen, Momo responded, her smile towards him as tender as she could be. Then she turned her gaze towards Isane, her smile growing increasingly hollow. Pleasure meeting you, Vice Captain Sama. Isane felt a chill crawl up her spine, sensing resemblance between Momo and her own Captain's unnerving smile. ERM, yes, likewise. Kazuya found the scene hilarious. The tall Isane cowering before a relatively short Momo. Only when they exited did Isane shake off her meat facade. She lowered herself onto the bed beside him, her eyes fastened on the Zanpakuto cradled in his lap. It seems different, did something happen? She could feel spiritual energy around the katana, 
which was absent in their last meeting. Even the physical shape was different from her memories. I'm surprised you noticed the difference, he said, holding up his katana. She told me her name. I can finally use her Shikai form. Isane's face lit up with a genuine, warm smile, wiping away the hesitancy that had clouded her features earlier. I'm glad you succeeded. Congratulations for earning the qualifications to be a vice captain. Don't congratulate me. I'm gonna replace you or Rangiku. Isane lightly shrugged. I'm not relinquishing my position in this life. She admired her captain too much to change her division. Ah, well, Rangiku is the one who LL get the boot. Then she'll be jobless and burn through her savings drinking out of depression. I'll find her sipping sake in some alley, save her like a knight in shining armor, help her back on her feet, and win her heart. Flawless plan if I must say so myself. Keep those vile plans to yourself. Jeez, I haven't even joined the GoDi 13. Besides, I want to settle for the vice captain position. I'm aiming for the captain seat or the general commander seat. His audacious confidence gave her pause, locking her words in her throat. He had every quality to be a future captain apart from his lack of bankai, which would be solved in time. The same could be said for her but she was content living in Retsu Onohana's shadows rather than vying for her position. Isane crossed her arms. You can leave now. I de caution you to not use your Ryatsu and put pressure on your Ryatsu events. Got it? Also, don't worry about the Academy property damage. Captain Anohana said she'll take care of this. Wow. Your captain seems like a nice person. The gentlest soul you'll ever meet, Isane mumbled, her voice tinged with a reverent undertone as memories of her captain rescuing her from cutthroat criminals flickered through her mind. The haunting yet beautiful memories had changed her life for the better. I'm sorry for drifting off. Don't worry. It was cute. She cleared her throat, her cheeks blushing in spite of herself. His flirtatious ambiguity always kept her guessing, whether he was flirting with her or mocking her. But instead of wading further into that confusing territory, she chose to steer the conversation. About our previous talk, I also relayed your suggestion to Captain Anohana. Oh, what did she say? She said she's willing to consider it once she has met you face to face. Intrigue washed over him. So, he didn't even have to go seek out Anohana, she had opened the door for him. The question now was if she would show her crazy nature in their first meeting. How about attacking her out of nowhere make her submit like you did to Tsubasa? I despise Tsubasa, but I adore Anohana. There is a big difference, plus, he didn't he like his odds of beating Anohana in a straight fight without his hollow form. His Shikai specialized more in support than in offense unless he invoked Nami's destructive flames. Call me Izanami, for I wield the flames that govern life and death. Shush.